Welcome to Gradient Proof, a long-form discussion on a range of topics from AI to philosophy to entrepreneurship. We start each podcast sober and let the proof gradient the course of discussion. As always, we encourage you to drink with us. Welcome to the Gradient. So, shall we begin? Cheers. Yep. Cheers. All right. Some big news this week, huh? Quite a lot in the news. But some, um, some things were out of this world. Some you know things I mean. were out of this world. <laughs> yes. So, um, uh, of course, uh, one of the big events of this week was Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin making its flight into space, um, carrying with it both the youngest person to ever go into space, 18 mm. years old, and the oldest person to ever go into space, I believe, 84 years old. Right. And him and his brother, of course. <laughs> yes. Bezos and his brother. Um, so, you know, in, in the old podcast, we kind of dug into yeah. the meaning of, of, of certain occurrences, events, technologies. So what's your take on where this type of exploration and, you know, up until now, we've seen, you know, test flights, things like that. But the fact that you're seeing, you know, billionaires who are putting their most valuable thing that they have, right, their time, their life uh, on the line to then prove that these things are uh uh, you know, feasible and safe. What's your take? What's where? Where does this go? Um, where where does it go? Um, o- overall, I, I see this as being really exciting. Um, exciting for uh, humanity more generally. Mm-hmm. You know, there is always a common plot narrative of you, you know some of the first non-government activity in space is usually some form of space tourism. Right, whether you know recreationally going up and down exactly like this, or mm-hmm. maybe a low Earth orbit um, space station hotels, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then we we have a couple of other, you know, useful follow-ons of which can be asteroid mining or something else like that. Right. But but there seems to be a lot of initial interest in this um, non-government private expansion into space, mm-hmm. right? And, and I, I think this is um, an exemplification, um, perhaps, of that trend. Right, absolutely. So it, seem, you know, it seems like all those things you mentioned um, are, are, are very exciting. And if you look at what we saw this week with Branson mm-hmm. and Bezos, I mean, it may be similar to, you know, when there was a video of the Wright brothers, right, that when they, when they took off and flew for the first time. And... I think if you were alive then and you saw that plane take off, right, you might have some some uh, assumptions of, of where this goes, how this mm. how this um, how this develops over time. And I think maybe today we're we're better positioned to to make guesses of where space travel goes. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought one thing that was interesting uh, with the rockets that Elon was developing was this idea that you could travel around the world anywhere in the world within thirty minutes, right, and if if you could be go from here to Shanghai mm-hmm. to Dubai to somewhere in Europe within the same day, I mean, how does <coughs> something like that completely change how you know globalization, how things move around? I mean, if if there was an, another version of COVID or some kind of mm. pandemic, I mean, we'd probably be even more screwed. But um, it's kind of interesting to think about. Um, now that we can move places more quickly, just sure. like we went from the car to the plane to, you know, or the horse to the car, right? As, as things progressed, uh, it'll be interesting to see how, um, what, what, what takes advantage of that? What, what finds the most value in that quick transportation? Sure. And it, it's interesting you mention uh, the 30 minutes. It kind of almost builds upon last time we were talking about the, the Concorde mm. and now um, the, the re-arrival of supersonic commercial flight with mm. with, with Boom. And mm-hmm. I, I think United Airlines has, has already gone to contract mm. with with 20-odd, mm-hmm. some of them, right? Right, right. So, so I, I, I think generally it's, it's kind of exciting where if you think within our own lifetime, uh, we have actually seen the commercial rate of travel go backward, right? Mm. To now see that not 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 just readjust itself on the supersonic side, but right. potentially on this thirty minute possibility. Right. Um, we can look at it in in terms of uh, 
you, it, everything that goes along with that. It will probably, I imagine if you want to be in, in Shanghai within 30 minutes, right. it, it, with, with the exception of perhaps the, the, the space tourism element, which is kind of, or I guess a high earth element of, right. of it, right? Mm -hmm. But you're, you're probably going there principally for, for some business. Right. I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I, well, I, I, yeah, getting to Shanghai still c takes 13 hours. Right. So, right. so cutting that down. Yeah. It, you know, it's kind of interesting. It made me think mm. about uh, if you think, you know, I'm in manufacturing, I work mm. with factories and stuff. Right. Mm. And when you order something from Amazon, it's mm. not coming from the factory. Right. Sure. It's coming through a warehouse. And for it to get to that warehouse, depending on the product, the size, and how you mm. shipped it, it could, you know, ship by plane, takes five days, more or less, depending on. If right. you overnight it, which is super expensive and not cost uh, effective, mm -hmm. or if you did it by ocean, which can take anywhere from like 13 to 30 days, right? Uh, so if you think about if you're, let's say, a factory in China, if, if manufacturing is still happening there, yeah. you know, once all this technology moves along, mm -hmm. you'll be able to almost drop ship directly from the factory floor sure. within, let's say, a couple hours sure. when it's dropped off um, to, to the actual consumer. Sure. Um, and, you know, I think the one interesting thing you mentioned earlier is once we go into space, we're going to find all types of asteroids, mm -hmm. ch chunks of material and abundance that nobody can even imagine. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then once you have those additional materials, whether it's some form of uh, mineral or whatever that can be used to create energy or whatever it might be. Right. Like if you found a big chunk of coal or I don't know something, but um or triple bonded oxygen right, right for right. fusion reaction lying all about the moon right things like that yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. finding all those things right mm -hmm. and then it allows you to power like you know uh rockets going off every few seconds because mm -hmm. i mean right now if you look at you know planes or i think the statistic sure. for boeing is like every few seconds a boeing plane lands or takes off sure and, and it's interesting you mentioned the the propulsion as well because i think um, the, the basis launch in particular has had mm. its own set of critiques, right? Mm. In, in fact, I, right. I think I saw one headline saying something like um, the, perhaps more criticism has been fo f foisted upon this launch than mm. anything else, which, which perhaps is unfortunate mm -hmm. in, in different ways. Right. But, uh, but one of the, the, the criticisms that have been flat out wrong is mm. the misunderstanding of the fact that um, a, a liquid nitrogen prepared, mm. propelled mm. rocket vehicle, right, is not in effect creating pollution, right? Mm. Or at least the type of pollution that, that is, you, you, you know, people look at a rocket and they think of exhaust and they think of burning, right? right? right. But the byproduct of that is ultimately water vapor, right? right? right. So, so it isn't the environmental calamity, right, having all these rockets going up and down, right? Mm that um, it, it's thought to be, right? Mm. Now, will it create, um, to, to, to your argument, a, a desire for perhaps other sources of a liquid nitrogen material or other mm -hmm. propellant-like material, mm -hmm. right? That's probably true, right? right? right. But, uh, but in, in, in itself, right, um, th there isn't really much to be scared of, right, um, right. in, in uh, you know, having maybe uh, 10,000 rockets going up and down, right, um, right. every day. Uh, yeah, I, I, there's also a question, right? Mm -hmm. if, if the rocket only takes, let's say, 30 minutes to go mm -hmm. up and down versus a commercial airliner that flies mm -hmm. 14 hours to, mm -hmm. to go the same destination, how do those kind using of Using jet fuel. Using jet fuel. Using right, jet fuel, right, right. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know much about like electric planes or mm -hmm. anything like that, but um, I'm assuming there's gonna be a moment where rockets are deemed safe by the public mm -hmm. and we've talked about like you know public uh dogma towards right. a technology can actually be the biggest resistant for advancement right like nuclear yeah. energy you people don't want to go down that route because chernobyl and um you know all, all these other bad instances that mm -hmm. now when you when you really when you examine it it's 1950s technology but so just thinking about what like when like what, what is the full stop change, right? Is it like people are half and half, or do you think it'll be um, kind of an overnight or within, let's say, a year or so that people say, I I'd rather take a rocket than take a plane because I feel comfortable enough doing that versus, you know, flying in a plane and wasting. Many well, that's hours. a good question. I mean, I, 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 I don't see, I don't see the plane going away in any way, um, 
in, in the same way that when, when the, the jet engine arrived, cars didn't go away, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think but it's we're- different. It, it is different, but I, I think we'll continue to have planes. Mm -hmm. um, to your earlier question about electric planes, um, the, the real difficulty is really about um, being able to transport sufficient energy as required, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And at the, at the moment, we just simply don't have the battery technology, right, mm -hmm. to 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 move right a large passenger plane in in any form of any interesting distance, right, right, right. and and un unfortunately that will probably remain so for a little while, right. Mm -hmm. So um, so uh, you you know uh, fuel, particularly jet fuel, right has um, the, the, the greatest transportable right. per unit energy, right, right that, that, that is perhaps the only energy source mm -hmm. um, that you, you can't do it with coal, right? right you're right. not gonna fly it on a, right. a natural gas or to mm -hmm. anything else, but right. it's, it's literally jet fuel that, that allows you to do that, right? right. Um, having said that though, that doesn't mean like, um, you know, uh, batteries could get better, um, maybe, you know, maybe potentially charge capacitor technology, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which isn't exactly a battery per se, right? Where where you could literally, you, you know, um, um, output into these ideas of these very, very, uh, what, what they call these mega or giant capacitors, right? right, right. Um, but, but that in itself requires um, a high degree of, um, you know, a material advancement, right? That, that mm -hmm. we're putting chipping away at, but we're, right. we're just not quite there. Uh, certainly again, to, to move, uh, you know, a 300 pr passenger aircraft with luggage, any interest of, in any, any, like, it's not gonna get you anywhere. Right. Yeah. C crazy idea that just yeah. popped in my head, right? So yeah. obviously the, well, the issue here, right, is, you, you want a fuel that is mm -hmm. going to be the lightest possible with the most amount of output. Mm -hmm. We spoke last time about genetic engineering and, uh, you know, manipulating uh, DNA, let's say, you know, or molecules and stuff like that. What if there was a way that you could uh, take up an extremely light substance mm. and then have it funnel through a molecular changer? I mean, this is like totally sci-fi stuff. But then once you needed it, you could convert it by changing the molecules of it to then become that whatever that fuel is, right? And the best case scenario would be you do you you would use whatever's abundant, right? So mm -hmm. if you turn air into jet fuel mm -hmm. through some crazy you know system, right? sure. Um, but obviously, I mean that stuff's probably a long ways away. Right? Well, but but interesting, I I think the very process you describe, and and, and this isn't really to make a in, in argument for for what is, but isn't that kind of the, the the very process where you have this organic molecular model of matter, right? Mm -hmm. Over hundred thousands of years of heat and pressure, right? right, right. Is um, condensed down into this rarefied liquid right. form, right? Right. That within one other process right becomes be, becomes usable right but, but but yeah those materials that become that you know based on pressure mm -hmm. and the conditions that they were for a long time are is the natural com, you know composition mm -hmm. where it ends up when you observe it right? sure so um the question is how do you like replicate something like that so that it matches it on a molecular level right mm -hmm. i mean it, you're probably gonna run into issues that like impossible meat and uh, or beyond meat are running into where it's like you can create something that has the same i don't know taste mm -hmm. as chicken or whatever but you're not going to get those tendons and that muscle mm. that made that you know chick-fil-a sandwich how good it is right mm -hmm. because you, you how do you build up that resistance and i, I mean I, I don't know i'm guessing they're working on it but i wonder if there's a way that you could do that somehow Sure. Um, I mean, look, if we're living in a simulation and all this stuff is simulated anyways, mm. isn't there a way you can, there's probably a way you can find a way to, to tweak the molecular code to some sure. degree. To, to some degree. Um, yeah, in, in, interesting. But okay, let's do a little like thought experiment. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's say in the next 
recent history, mm-hmm. you, you've got um, you know the Shepard going up, you've got SpaceX going up, mm-hmm. and they're bringing back asteroids. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you can essentially find you know asteroids made of diamond, made of gold, made mm-hmm. of all these different materials. Um, some that'll be rare, considered rare on Earth, right? So, what do you think would happen if one of them bring back a uh, asteroid the size of Manhattan that's mm-hmm. made of, of diamond? That that's made of a diamond. Well, and how quickly does De Beers go out of business? Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, I, I I think your argument is is a good one. It's interesting. Um, I, I I just wonder at at, at some point. Right, with, with, whether it be gold or diamond or, or silver, mm. right? Um, it, it it seems as if their 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 stored value utility, right, a, as kind of a monetary value, right, mm-hmm. has always been in some ways kind of eroding a little bit over time, right? Meaning that um, the, the the dollar isn't backed against um, right. you know gold in the way it once was. In the emergence of cryptocurrencies, right, one could make the argument that that not that gold doesn't have value; it's just the fact that it, it almost seems that certain economies are moving further and further away from from a, a, a pure disruption to gold right. really being that substantial, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe you could make the same argument with with the diamonds, where um, you you know a, along the way. You, you, you know, artificial diamonds have gotten better. You, you know, right. there, there's still a back and forth of, you know, whether there's an uh, openness to artificial wedding rings or not. Mm-hmm. But but I think we could both agree it's still different than it was, say, 20 years ago. Right, right, right. right. And so so I, I, I don't know if, if I, I, I don't know if the economic disruption, particularly as you, you, you know, this isn't going to come down by surprise, right? right? right. Um, it's going to take a little while to develop out the wherewithal to, to even attempt to do something like that. Right, right. And, and the whole world and the financial world is going to be watching right. and adjusting appropriately, oh, right? Yeah. And, 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 and their adjustments are probably going to look a little less like a crash as much as, you know, a slow decline of the value of whether it be, you know, there, there, there's a lot of silver around those asteroids are going around, right? Well, why do you and say you slow? S- I mean, um, it, if, it, if it gets announced, yeah. there's, um, you know, a huge sure. wall, you know, uh, thing coming to, to, to Earth. Right. And you, right now, you let's say whatever the percentage of silver or gold or whatever you have no. multiplies by a quadrillion. No, I mean, no. What, what, what I mean to say is I, I, I think... I, I think when we're on the verge of mm. first sending, you know, mining vehicles out to asteroids, right? right, right okay, right. and then actually starting to mine on asteroids, right? Mm. And then even a further step, because each of these are steps, right? right? Starting to actually bring back what we've mined right. from asteroids, right? Because mm. remember, asteroid mining doesn't necessarily always mean the most logical place to take those resources or back to Earth, right? right? Um, you, you know, you, you can use it as raw material. First of all, it's a, just a case study, mm. right? And then you can use it for raw material for, you know, um, you, you, you know, moving certain resources to other places like right. a lunar base or a Martian base, et cetera. Right. But I think in each of these steps, right, okay, along the way, right, um, you'll probably see N- not, again, not a crash, but a, a, a declining interest in, mm-hmm. you know, um, you'll, you'll have less buy gold commercials on TV, right? right? right. And, and, and it's gonna slowly kind of take the, the air out of the, the tire a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's just a thought, right? I, I throw that out there, maybe. Yeah, right? yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, no, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you say that if you were to mine those things, it mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily mean you want to bring them back to Earth. I mean, I'm sure there would be some level of import, but if you're going to build spaceships made mm-hmm. of these metals, whatever they are, um, and you're dealing with heavy weight and stuff like, you know, uh, it would probably be best to do it on some kind of like lunar base, like mm-hmm. on the moon or something like that, where, you know, you have one guy moving a shell with, with, with a really weak machine that is just yeah. 
you know, sufficient enough to move on a different type of gravity, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think we've talked about this before, but you know, if if there's still this this view of nuclear or all these like more dangerous energies, mm -hmm. right? And you produce that in kind of a no man's land, right? Or there are very few hu humans mm -hmm. like on the moon, and somehow we're able to teleport that energy down. Maybe batteries or maybe there's a some kind of cable system that kind of clicks as things rotate. Um, but yeah, you know, I, th I think that that's going to be super interesting because there's so many things you can do there mm. under the, this new environment and also mm -hmm. less risk to you know everyday people. Right? I mean, you're not going to have obviously something that uh, you're not going to care about emissions. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how it would work in space, but as far mm -hmm. as you can't smoke. There's no fire in space, right? I mean, it's it's a vacuum, right? Um, <clears throat> so, I, anyways, it's it's interesting. I was just thinking. Well, let's go back to, um, uh, you know, if you brought a diamond, down, mm -hmm. right? And okay, maybe that will that'll change the market there. But mm -hmm. you know, the market, I guess, American culture and the way that it views diamonds, mm -hmm. and maybe a few other more Western countries view diamonds is unique because of the um, the marketing that De Beers mm -hmm, did, mm -hmm, Diamond mm -hmm. is Forever, Girls Best Friend, yep. all that, all of that, right? But it's so interesting how it's so baked into how sure. everyday people here think, right? Yeah. Uh, but if you were to go somewhere else, uh, or even America before then, I mean, what was the way that people showed each other that they were committing for life? Probably just being nice to each other mm, sure. instead of buying diamonds. Yeah. No, but you yeah. know what I mean. Um, sure. I wonder what the graph is between diamonds ri rising in popularity mm -hmm. in comparison to how many people get engaged to sure. diamonds uh, in comparison to um, divorce. Oh, uh, that I don't know. Is like the height of the diamond. Who knows? Yeah. Anyways, fun to ponder. Yeah, fun to ponder. I, I, you know, I'd imagine this particular use case of, of diamonds, um, I, I, I could actually see it rising as kind of the the establishment of a, a middle class, mm -hmm. right? A, 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 a marrying middle class, right? Mm -hmm. That is kind of, you know, um, beginning to uh, have the economic resources uh, to to do things right mm -hmm. that I mean if you go back may, maybe about you know 150 200 years who who had like real jewelry right, right? in the context of, of, of diamonds or, or things like that right, right? right. And, and actually displayed them mm -hmm. right you know um, probably relatively few right, right? And then uh, the idea of, to, to, to your point, uh, the De Beers reality mm -hmm. of more or less uh, um, a, a ring or a potential ring on a, a far statistical greater number of people, right? right. Um, I, I, I think that begins to, to kind of, I, I, I don't know, maybe the late 1800s kind of moving on and on in, in maybe the 1900s, mm -hmm. if you will, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just can't imagine going back to like if you know in in the 1700s right, we're right. wearing any sort of ring um of right. with with any embedded stone would probably be impractical to the type of work you were doing right so there and right. again right unless you're just um you know lounging about in you you, you know versailles like conditions right which right. would again was a very very small group right right um people just didn't have a big jewelry right or, or jewelry of this sort yeah yeah it, it makes me think so yeah um thinking about right now it's it's a it, it's a visual representation of mm -hmm. whatever love togetherness but the size of the rock and all that that also says something about the person the mm -hmm. marriage the financial situation right um but i wonder if people if there's as much i'm not showing off but like voyeurism and vanity and all these like when did that really i mean have humans always hmm. you know a acted like that sure like keeping up with the joneses right keeping up with whatever the carpenter next door hmm. i mean i guess there's probably some competition but in today's day and age it's so visual mm -hmm. and i think there's a, a lot of issues with that right because 
if you see someone that's kind of living a certain type of lifestyle, mm -hmm. there's so many things you can hide within it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the visual is there, right? But if you look at the guys or gals or whatever accounts, right, and you see they're like $50 million in debt and they're mm -hmm. completely uh, have no grasp to reality and their mm -hmm. house is being possessed, you're not going to see that stuff, right? But I guess that comes down to all of that is about appearance, right? And I don't, mm. I think we've probably always been uh, aware, at least to some degree, of our own appearance in the tribe, right? That's sure. how you survive. You, you right? Hmm. Mm hmm. Well, jewelry more generally is not a new thing, that's for sure, right? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But it was kind of, it was very, it was like the, not the 1%, like the one family or whatever in that area, right? I guess if I we're mean, going, going back to back, like kings and queens and... Yeah, kings and queens. And stuff, yeah. No, but uh, what I mean, jewelry as in the sense of ornamentation, right, right, right is right. not new. Now, mm -hmm. statistically, what that would have looked like mm -hmm. and how it may have varied from place to place, right. that I, I, I don't know, right? But, um, you know... Uh, ornamentation diamonds or otherwise right we, we can talk about jewels right yeah. seashells we, mm -hmm. we can talk about you, you know um it li literally anything i i don't know yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure yeah definitely uh so you've been reading a book recently yes right? as recommended by roy <laughs> Pierre. <laughs> yes it, it's it, it's been a yeah. little while since i read it so mm -hmm. i mean uh, do you mind yeah. Letting us know where you're at and what, what your thoughts are on it. Sure. So Roy had recommended uh, the book to me called uh, uh, The Rational Optimist, right, which mm -hmm. was published in 2010 and uh, very much kind of makes reference to the, the recent financial crisis, as we know, 2008, 2009, right? And it takes, it, it, it takes um, a very kind of positivist view, right, of... Um, the the human experience, particularly as it experience has expanded through trade, right? Mm, of right, the ability right. to um, not not just trade, but transactions, the ability to right. tra transact uh, human to human, um, drawing attention again right. and again with the idea that humans are the only. Um, uh, species in the world that will exchange non-like goods right, right. so um you know you you, you know you, you give me a banana i'll give you an orange in exchange and, and the reason i use this example is because as hard as they've tried um in laboratory environments they simply cannot teach uh monkeys or orangutans to do that type of trade mm -hmm. right it's always a one for one Right. Mm -hmm. Or it's more of, uh, um, you, you know, uh, that, you, you know, I'll, I'll treat you nicely if, if you beg or I'll, I'll treat you nicely mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. we have, you know, good relations in the future, but never a, right. a, in exchange of non like objects. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in the but but it's larger argument is the fact that um, rather than, um, you know, the pessimism of certain cycles, uh, the the financial crisis being a moment of, of great pessimism and perhaps to a different degree um, our own moment right being mm -hmm. uh, you know a moment of you know economic uncertainty economic skepticism skepticism of capitalism more generally right mm -hmm. he takes the the opposite view that where um, transaction based economies right whether between uh, goods or ideas or people, right, have ultimately always yielded, right, right. Um, um, uh, a forever um, improvement upon, right, um, as opposed to otherwise, right, which uh, which I think is is a great thing to uh, consider. Well, I think I remember there was a bit uh, he was talking about technology as mm -hmm. well, so the yeah. trade of technology. So one example he used was. Um, because at the time Britain had better sewing technology mm -hmm. that um, material uh, you know clothing material from India mm -hmm. was actually taken on a voyage to England where it was then processed mm -hmm. and then sent back to India 
to then be like uh, stitched hmm. in a way that it could then sure. be exported. Sure. So there was a trade there that sending that whatever thousand thousands of mile journey to process that technology mm -hmm. was more efficient, whether in time, cost, whatever it sure. was, than just leaving it in India and using whatever the the technology was there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, there's this interesting trade and way that humans interact that you're not going to see anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because if you think of whatever the first trade was that happened within the species mm -hmm. leading up until now, the trillions and trillions of, of trades that allowed for all of these different pieces, sure. things in front of us, the way people are listening now, you traded your money for AirPods as you listen to this on the treadmill, right? Mm -hmm. Or whatever that might be. And that treadmill was constructed because you know, people invested money into whatever that company was by either buying the product or investing in, in the leadership to then build that, which then sits in a building that is run under the name of a gym mm -hmm. that, you know, all these different things kind of proceeded um, and sometimes maybe at different, uh, at different speeds, right? Mm -hmm. Like you might say that um, the, the iPhone is way more developed than a typewriter mm -hmm. because at some point the typewriter uh, from a cultural level, right. was not significant enough to have attention given to it. But then on the other end, there might be a large innovation that um, is sitting there untapped because no one is focusing on or pushing forward sure. that that opportunity to trade, right? And, and it's interesting um, when when you when you go to the the typewriter example, mm -hmm. right? Um, th there was also kind of the idea that uh, before the transistor, uh, mm. we, we, we had the vacuum tube, mm. right? Mm. And uh, when, when we had the beginning of the transistor revolution, you had all these cheap transistors coming out, right? right. It wasn't as if vacuum tubes didn't continue to improve, right? right? It, it was just the fact that the, the, the transistors were cheaper, right? right. right. But, but ironically enough, I, I, I think where you're going with that, there, there are still applications mm -hmm. for these improved vacuum tubes. Mm -hmm. And it's also an interesting question when we think about how technology is developed, right? Mm -hmm. One could wonder if, did we perhaps abandon right. the vacuum tube a little too early, right? Be, not, not necessarily to say that the, the, the vacuum tube is, is, is a better supplement for the transistor, mm -hmm. but in further developing the vacuum tube, the technology to come right after it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, again, probably moving in a slightly different direction as right. to what the transistor is, right? Is something that maybe uh, um, culturally we just didn't explore, right? Right. Um, right. Just a thought, right? right. And yeah. it, you know, the, yeah. um, you know, there's plenty of times of, of missed opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not only in technologies themselves, but also, you know, people, right? I mean, how many people during World War I um, died, you know, because of whatever the reason for the war was, mm. but when they were in the trenches, they were writing maybe the novel that would then 30 years later be read by a young person who would then end up inventing mm. the cure for life, right? So there's so many... Um, uh, butterfly effects that happen yeah. from that and when you put you know let's say for war you have a huge loss of life and you lose that all of that potential right mm. you know why is it that when people look at let's say a tragedy that happened to like a baby let's say you know if a child left this world like too soon right yeah it, and but if someone were to look at someone who is 90 years old had cancer alzheimer's there's a completely different uh, response right and mm -hmm. I, I think the the main thing is is the difference of opportunity between the mm. two, right? The person that's ninety has lived their life, has has given some kind of shot at life, but you know, uh, there's maybe there's there's inherent reaction to a, l a life that's lost too soon mm -hmm. that they weren't able to reach their potential, even if their potential doesn't end up being much. Mm -hmm. There's still a chance because we don't live in a world where it's like if you're born in this neighborhood or in this. Uh, you know, class or whatever, mm -hmm. that you are guaranteed to have some kind of output. Maybe statistically, it's will go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But there's always that opportunity that somebody can do a lot of good. Mm -hmm. There's also the same opportunity that people can do a lot of bad. But I think people tend to look at other humans. And I think, you know, more positively.
mm -hmm. of, of their outcomes. Um, yeah, we just went for a loop. Um, also, I mean, talking about if you would have stayed with one technology and not jumped to the other, mm -hmm. is kind of circled ba this circles back to what we were talking about earlier with leaving the plane mm -hmm. for, the for the rocket ship mm -hmm. as, as a form of transportation. Um, and I think you're right. I think there, to go back to the, I, I think jets will still be around for mm -hmm. shorter flights. Yeah. Where it's, it's just it, from, oh, I guess it depends on the energy, but from an energy level. Mm -hmm. right? um, what was your take in the book? He talks about, I'm not sure if you got here, but like energy is essentially our slaves, right? Mm -hmm. And the, everything we do is at the expense of energy, right? Mm -hmm. We came up an elevator to get here the light that's on, the mic that's collecting mm -hmm. the sound waves, right? Um, and we've talked about this before, but, you know, what happens in a, as energy becomes cheaper or becomes essentially free, mm -hmm. right, however it's captured or created, sure. Um, what that means for everyday life, uh, you know, people, the things that we do now that are um, mm -hmm. conservative, right? Mm -hmm. And before you answer, let me just give an example of like um, internet connectivity, you know, 3G, 4G, 5G. Mm -hmm. In, <coughs> excuse me. I, you know, I think initially when I heard, oh, 5G, is it, what do you need all this extra bandwidth mm -hmm. for, right? But mm -hmm. when you start really peeling into it, you see that there's so many things that you could do from a computational level on larger sure. devices that you couldn't do because of the way you receive that data. Um, or how quickly you receive that data uh, to make it a good experience on a mobile level yeah. or or on a, a bandwidth level. Um, like, you know, AR experiences, sure. simulated worlds, like eventually like Web 3.0 where you're overlaying your own information on the world around you. Mm -hmm. um, so, sure. Yeah. No, and, and understood. And, and it's interesting to, I, I think of the book, he, he goes back and again and again to the idea of you know throughout the broader sweep of human history for you to improve your standard of living there, there are really only what two ways to do it right and that was um have slaves at work for you right, right. or otherwise have people that were in some form of indentured servitude toward you mm -hmm. right um, that um, would allow you somehow a superior quality of life to, to those around you, right? Because mm -hmm. you'd have servants for this and servants for th that, and um, you you know uh, you, you you could utilize um, you you know slave labor in your fields or indentured servants in your field, and your quality of life would improve, right? Mm -hmm. um, but with um, right. the uh, the access, right, to to real caloric energy, right, at a per person level, right, right? right. you don't need any of that right to to improve your livelihood mm -hmm. right um and, and in fact with more energy society writ large doesn't need any of that either right? right that's actually a very inefficient way to to go about doing things right um you know why would you want four people to to help you run a hot bath right mm -hmm. when calorically you, you you could do that same activity so much more efficiently right, right, right. and and just simply turn the knob right, right? and in right. in every example kind of falls into these different categories right? Right, right um so but 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 leading to your other point is not only i i i would argue um the 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 greater energy is forever tied to greater quality of life right mm -hmm. um we we should always think about um um uh, a, a greater abundance of energy meaning that for example when you talk about energy being free right mm -hmm. um i would posit that um the future is not about free energy the right. the future is about greater amounts of energy cheaper right mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but but relativistically cheaper right mm -hmm. so so my hope would be that you you know my 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 grandchildren right on a day-to-day -day basis, right, are calorically probably pulling down, um, you know, 10 to 20 or 30 X of what I'm pulling down, right, mm -hmm. um, in terms of their energy consumption, right? right? 
but but rather than that be a bad thing, right? That is to be celebrated in the same way that my own energy consumption vis-a-vis -vis somebody in 1920 